Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Chart Speaker Series, one of our talks in the Chart Speaker Series. I'm Nancy Cook, Director of the Center for Human Artificial Intelligence and Robot Teaming, and I think I know most of you. Uh, if you are interested in the other chart uh, talks, there will be uh, some coming up in the, two coming up in the future. One is um, Daniel Serpati of Aptima will be speaking, and Clive Wynn of ASU will be speaking about uh, human dog teaming behavior. But today, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Lance Garavi, uh, who's going to talk to us about where they come from, theses on robots and the cultural imaginary. And I think Lance gave a version of this talk uh, at one of our uh, lab meetings, and it was uh, really, really exciting and interesting. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Garavi. He's an experimental artist, um, a scholar, and an associate professor in the School of Music, Dance, and Theater, and associate director of the Interplanetary Initiative at Arizona State University. <clears throat> He's truly uh, himself a transdisciplinary person. He's an early pioneer in the field of digital performance and is specialized in leading collaborative transdisciplinary teams of artists, scientists, designers, and engineers to create original and innovative experiences. And I've been working with him now on a couple of different projects. One is our uh, testbed chartopolis or robot robotopolis is what Dr. Garavi likes to call it. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you really need to. It's both a, a test bed for research on autonomous vehicles and it's an art installation. And we're currently working on our second test bed slash art installation. And I think he may be talking a little bit about that. So welcome, Dr. Garavi. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Nancy, uh, for that introduction. And uh, thank you to Chart for inviting me uh, to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to share my screen, I think. Uh, so that you have something nicer to look at than my face. Um, so um, I, I'm the director of Ars Robotica. Uh, Ars Robotica is a transdisciplinary initiative to advance research in robotics and AI through the methods and insights of the arts. Um, and, and as Nancy suggested, uh, we're collaborating with Chart to produce a testbed for experiments in distributed human AI and robot teaming. The project is funded by a DURP grant from the Office of Naval Research. And as Nancy also told you, uh, in addition to being a site for scientific research, the testbed will also be an art installation. Now, this is an unusual combination. I honestly don't know anyone else that's making work like this. And as such, I, I think it's uh, <laughs> a super fitting uh, uh, project for ASU. Um, now to create this test bed, I'm working with a team of just really extraordinary artists, uh, Max Bernstein, William Kirkham, and Brunella Providente. Um, and our primary goal is to create a space that facilitates research, but we're also making an art space, a performance space, a, a, a space for reflection and meditation on the kinds of activities that take place within it. Um, and my purpose here today is to share with you some of the thoughts that inform our, uh, our efforts. So um, I, I don't remember my first encounter with a robot. I don't know, maybe it was watching the Jetsons or Lost in Space. Maybe it was a picture in a children's book. It's hard to say. Um, whatever it was, I'm sure it wasn't in a laboratory. I'm sure it wasn't a real robot. I'm sure it was some fictional story about the future. What, what about you all? Um, what was your first encounter with a robot? There's, there's only like, you know, less than two dozen of us here. Uh, maybe someone would, would share. Uh, 
Do you remember, anybody remember their first encounter with, with a robot? Um, I actually do. Uh, when I was around five, I wanted a pet dog, but my parents didn't want to get us um, an actual one, so they got us a robotic dog. So we took care of that instead. Really? So your, your first encounter with a robot was with a real robot, not, mm -hmm. not something on television or in a film or in a book? Um, no, we didn't really watch a whole lot of TV when we were little. That's great. That's amazing. Anyone else? I think it was lost in space for me. Lost in space, yes, absolutely. I, wasn't the robot's name I Robot? I remember watching it. Uh, Li Xiao? Um, sorry. Um, I remember uh, Dora Amon. It's a, a Japanese uh, cartoon movie, and that robot cat has a. Uh, uh, is a all powerful pocket has everything and and he can uh, do all kinds of things that that's my uh, first impression of robots it's a, a robot cat that's that's great um I'm, but i'm willing to bet that for for most of you uh uh the uh, and i'm sorry i didn't see your name uh in the in the uh box but uh except the person that that his first experience was this robot dog. I'm willing to bet for most of you, your first encounter with a robot wasn't, probably wasn't some real robot in a lab somewhere or in a factory. It was probably some imaginative representation or a story. And my point is that even for most robotics engineers and scientists, our, our first encounters with robots aren't typically with a real robot in the real world, but with a fictional representation, a character in the imaginary world of a story. And this is true not only for our first encounters with robots, but surely and usually for our second and third and 28th and on and on to some unknown number. So, this observation leads me to a key point. Robots uh, live a dual and simultaneous existence. They exist as objects in the real world. Th uh, these are the robots we encounter at work, in the laboratory, in the factory, perhaps in the home or workplace. There are Roombas and Baxters and Nows and Yumis and Huskies and, and uh, toy dogs and all these marvelous wonders of engineering. But robots also exist in what is called the cultural imaginary. Um, so the concept of the cultural imaginary comes from the work of Cornelius Castoriadis and Charles Taylor, uh, among others, who wrote of what they called the social imaginary. Now, the social imaginary is, um, uh, describes the, quote, investment by society of the world and itself with meaning. Importantly, these meanings are not dictated or determined by real things in the world. Rather, these meanings give to real things a particular importance and a particular place in the universe. Now, the cultural imaginary describes the ways in which the social imaginary is given concrete form through the products of culture, stories, images, performances, and the cultural productions of art, literature, film, television, media, religion, and public practices. Importantly, the imaginary is not some hazy dream. It's not theoretical, um, but it is, in fact, the very fabric which allows for our practices and ways of living to make sense and to have legitimacy. The representations and stories and all the various significations that constitute the imaginary create social reality. They're world-making, and thus they shape the psyches of individuals, all of us. So robots exist, therefore, in this kind of dual plane. They exist as objects in our laboratories and factories, but they're given meaning 
a set of relations, values, associations, and connotations by their place in the cultural imaginary. There, their meaning is produced and maintained by a set of stories and representations and performances. And their participation in the cultural imaginary is what transforms them from mere objects into the complex collection of ideas that we call robots. So, if we acknowledge that, that for me and for many of you who work with robots professionally, you who build them and modify them and experiment with them and write brilliant articles about them for peer-reviewed scientific journals, if we acknowledge that we first encountered robots in stories and images on TV and in films and science fiction novels and comic books as action figures and illustrations on birthday party napkins, then robots, as figures within the cultural imaginary, come first. And not by a little, by years and repeatedly over and over. By the time we started working with robots professionally, we may have had years of experiences with robots, dozens, maybe hundreds of encounters. In our experience of robots, the imaginary precedes the material. And these repeated encounters with the imaginary shaped and informed our eventual encounters with the material. Because how could they not? It's what gives those material objects meaning and places them in relation to other things in the world. And this formative process continues. Each interaction with robots in the lab is ineluctably shaped and made meaningful by a set of significations that constitute the cultural imaginary. So the precession of the imaginary thus functions for us on a personal level, describing our own individual histories. But it also functions at the level of history writ large, as I'm going to address a little later. So uh, the testbed we're designing will specifically investigate how robots and AI can serve to assist in human rescue scenarios. Imagine a soldier on a battlefield or civilians in distress after a natural disaster. How might robots come to the rescue? So we often imagine that technology will damn us, that our, our wondrous inventions will someday bring about our downfall and destruction. This is the classic Frankenstein narrative that is surely familiar to most of you. Uh, this narrative was amplified at the, at the dawn of the atomic age. Uh, see, for instance, Godzilla and a, a thousand drive-in movie horrors. And further accelerated during the information age. See Jurassic Park, Terminator, Transcendence, etc., etc. So as a culture, we often view technology with great suspicion and even fear. But just as often, perhaps... We imagine that technology will save us. Now, this is a fantasy that drives the concept of progress and innovation, a word very germane to ASU. Uh, advances in, in, in science and technology are really largely what we mean when we talk of progress. We imagine that such advances will cumulatively make life better for us, that it will cure our illnesses, and, and not just our medical ones, but our social and behavioral ones, too. We imagine that it'll solve our problems and ultimately lead to some vaguely imagined utopia. Uh, the ultimate form of this fantasy comes to us in Ray Kurzweil's concept of the singularity, this idea that, that technology will transform us someday into these super powerful, all-knowing creatures. In, in Kurzweil's vision, we fragile mortals will someday become like unto angels. Uh, more mundanely, 
we see our hopes for salvational technologies in the discourse around some of our greatest current challenges. Climate change, for instance. Hey, artificial trees are being developed at ASU that can pull carbon out of the air. Or our current global pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, we, we hope that science will come through with a vaccine to save us all. So we fantasize about robots saving us from labor and AI figuring out the hardest problems. And, and our fantasy of robotics and AI is often a utopian one. And this fantasy is, is played out again and again in pop culture narratives like, like the film WALL-E, um, but I think is illustrated more fully and more seriously in Aaron Bastani's 2018 nonfiction book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, in which the author predicts robotics, AI, and array of other technologies will usher in this post-scarcity age. All right. So where was I? Um, oh, I was talking about um, uh, this book by uh, Aaron Bastani called um, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. Um, so so the, the author predicts that there'll come a day when, when robotics and AI and a bunch of other technologies will, will uh, uh, usher in a kind of post-scarcity age where we don't need to labor any longer in order to survive. Uh, Bastani's dream is that technology will save us not only from drudgery and poverty and hunger and want, but also from the oppressive set of destructive relations of modern global capitalism. Um, so fundamentally, we imagine technology as that which will rescue us from our predicaments and even from ourselves. This is part of its fantasy and allure. Um, so I, I want to say something that might surprise some of you. Um, theater invented robots. Uh, theater invented robots. Uh, of course, mechanical automatons have existed for centuries, but the word robot was uh, coined by a uh, Czech playwright, Karel Čepek, uh, in 1920, in his play RUR, uh, which stands for Rossum's Universal Robots. So Chapek's play was quickly translated into English and it was produced in the US the following year. Um, and his robots captured the imagination of generations of science fiction writers, as well as scientists and engineers. Uh, and the play really lays out the basic themes that define our conceptions of robots to this day. Okay, so in a sense, yes, theater invented robots, ha ha ha, we can have a laugh and wink and feel good that we understand metaphor, but I'm not speaking metaphorically. Theater invented robots in a literal sense. Robots began as theater and have remained mostly theater to this day. Robots are most significantly a certain set of signs and narratives that are laden with values and visions of the future, of human identity, of alienness, of labor, autonomy, and of agency. And all of this was born of Chapek's play. So, of course, robots aren't just narratives. Real robots exist in the world, and many of you work with them. So robots vacillate back and forth between the imaginary and the material, between science fiction and science realities of actual machines in factories, warehouses, laboratories, and homes. All robots perform on what uh, Marvin Carlson refers to as the haunted stage. That is to say, they're all haunted by the ghosts, not of actual robots in the world, but of the robots of fictional narratives, and more specifically, of performances. Are you are, how, the Terminator, Robbie, Rosie, C-3PO, Data, and the Cylons. It is these fictions, these theatrical, televisual, and cinematic ghosts that produce the robots of today. 
And these ghosts haunt real robots throughout their existence through ideation and design of new robots in the marketing and in the laboratory and in the field. Robot narratives still dominate and shape the development of the material forms robots take, how we imagine them, how we respond to them. In other words, the narratives and representations of robots, which began as such and are sustained as such, have material consequences in the world. The stories aren't just stories. They shape and they give form to the world we live in. So I've noted that on a personal level, we encounter robots as figures in the cultural imaginary long before we meet them in reality in the laboratory or the factory. But for robots, the cultural imaginary precedes the material, not just personally, but also historically. Robots were theater first. They began as science fiction. And they significantly remain so. So, um, next slide. So, these narratives and representations are connected to ideas about race, humanity, and labor in the context of capitalism. It, it may seem like a weird stretch to connect robots and race, but it's fundamental to understanding not only where we're coming from with this um, testbed project, but where robots themselves come from and where they've been all along. So, Chapek's play specifically engages the American institution and history of slavery. The, the robots in Chapek's play are slaves, made to work so that humans don't have to, made to replace human labor. So they create, if only temporarily, the kind of post-work paradise that Marx imagined would be the end point of technology. And, and here we see the salvational, the salvational aspect of technology. Ultimately, however, for those of you, and those of you who read the play know, Chapek's robots rebel against their bondage. They overthrow their masters in this violent, bloody rebellion that wipes out the human race entirely. And so Chapek's play features both the salvation and damnation narratives of technology but it also narrates the racialized terror of slaves and of slave rebellion and of oppressed classes more generally that's so embedded in the history of the US from even before its founding. So lest you think that this is some exotic reading of Chapek's play, it's worth pointing out that Chapek coined the term robot from the Czech word for slave. Robot means slave. And this sense has really never left the idea of robots. It permeates their whole history in the cultural imaginary, in literature, film, television, comic books, and other media. So the history of robots is entangled with race, among other things. And this history is complex and, in fact, predates the invention of robots as cultural and technological figures. Its origins lie in the 18th and 19th centuries, most formidable forces, industrialization, uh, capitalism, and slavery. So in the science fiction stories that followed RUR, mastery over fictive robots narrates a transformation from the previous century's master-slave relationship to mastery over machines, while simultaneously maintaining the defining values of superiority and control, concepts that acquire their gravity through comparison with the opposite condition of enslavement. This story, the dream of mastery over slaves, continued, albeit in a new technologized form. Um, so an, an example may help illustrate what I'm getting at. Um, so uh, let's look at, at two of film's most famous robots, R2-D2 and C-3PO. So in the first Star Wars film, the, the robots escape the princess's ship and uh, uh, crash land on Tatooine and they're, they're wandering about the, uh, the endless, waste, endless waste of the desert. And they're captured 
by these creatures called Jawas, who clearly function as metaphors for the slavers who captured black people from Africa. Uh, uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO, they get thrown into the bowels of this nightmarish sand crawler, a vehicle that navigates the ocean of sand like the slave ships of previous centuries navigated the Atlantic. The ship arrives, finally, at a farm, and R2-D2 and C-3PO are taken out and lined up with all these other robots to be inspected by Luke Skywalker and his uncle. Uh, Luke's uncle eventually purchases R2-D2 and C-3PO and is confident that they will neither rebel nor escape their enslavement because of their restraining bolts, which function as a kind of digital shackles. R2-D2 and C-3PO are clearly slaves, captured and sold into bondage. And lest there be any further doubt, maybe you remember what C-3PO calls Luke Skywalker. He calls him Master Luke. I, I, I really could go on uh, citing other examples from other narratives, but I think you get the idea. Robots exist in our cultural imaginary as what I call a fantasy of ethically immaculate slavery. This is where they come from, and they have remained so. This is where they began. Um, so I want to talk about the human for a moment. I've been talking a lot about robots. We imagine human to be an absolute term. We think of it as, as a fact about the world, that it's, that it's scientific, like the atomic weight of barium. But it isn't. Uh, the category human is always historically and culturally contingent. That is, what and who counts as fully human is always contested. Now, this isn't to deny biology. It is to affirm that who has been fully included in the set called human has been different in different times and in different cultures. For hundreds of years in the West, the category of human has been significantly understood as white, also male. Non-whites and, and women and other groups were and still are considered other, capital O imagined as something less than fully human. And I want you to know, I want you to understand that this is not some hazy disposition living in the hearts and minds of individuals. This is manifest in laws, in policies, in structures and actions that have material consequences. The struggle for black freedom and civil rights in the US indeed the struggle for women and other historically marginalized groups has largely been a struggle to be seen and treated as fully human. Indeed, the concept of race itself was invented to justify the practice of enslaving African people. To morally justify such brutality, the enslaved needed to be located in some imaginary category that identified them as somehow less than human. Race was invented to produce that category, as well as its contrary category of whiteness. Racism and white supremacy emerged as a set of material practices that policed and enforced these distinctions. So, Robots are positioned as the other in the cultural imaginary. They may have the apparent qualities of humanity, perhaps morphologically, but also at least some apparent agency, but they are definitionally not human. Whatever robots are, they are not human. So further, as we discussed, robots are racialized as non-white generally and black specifically. They are definitionally other and thus serve as ready allegories for historically marginalized groups. Further, because they are created for labor, servitude, and enslavement, they function specifically as allegories for black people. Um, as as Despina uh, 
Kakadukaki uh, writes, quote, uh, the metal exterior of the robot functions as a site for projecting numerous kinds of difference. And in this fundamentally ambiguous space, metalness can stand in for a type of blackness, or indeed for other states of abjection that the position of the African slave embodies in Western modernity. The robot's potential for racial or ethnic representation comes from its objecthood. The robot is a priori designed as a being whose ontological state maps perfectly with a political state. Robots are designed to be servants, workers, or slaves. So, if human equals white and robot equals black, then, uh, next slide, then human robot teaming is a kind of allegory for race relations within the context, oh, I lost my place here. Um, yeah, human robot uh, teaming is a kind of allegory for race relations with the co within the context of white supremacy and the labor relations of capitalism. Now, Having said this, I want to be clear about something. This isn't an indictment of CHART, its members, its mission, or its ambition. I'm not saying CHART is somehow racist or bad. This is simply an analysis of the cultural and historical uh, relations between humans and robots. I'm trying to establish the domain in which CHART and all such organizations and efforts operate. Um, so, in this testbed we're creating, robots will play the role of rescuers uh, in, in these rescue scenarios. They'll be rescuers, they'll be saviors. Um, given what I've described as uh, the racialization of robots, I see robots function in this scenario functioning like the familiar cinematic trope known as the magical Negro. Um, so, the Magical Negro is, uh, is a familiar character in American cinema. Uh, their narrative function is to come to the rescue of a white character who is in desperate need of saving. They are these salvational figures who, through their wisdom and, and frequently magical or mystical powers, help rescue uh, the protagonist in distress. Uh, often through helping them grow as people in the process. Um, the Magical Negro has no goals of their own. They're not agents with their own interests or storylines. They, they don't really develop as characters. They exist only to advance the needs and desires of the white protagonist. So similarly, the always already racialized robots in our testbed have no goals, no ambitions uh, of their own, apart from serving the interests of the human protagonists. Uh, in the experimental scenarios we'll enact in these test beds, the robots will be rescuers, coming to the help, literally or allegorically, of the white, allegorically white characters uh, and helping them achieve their desires. So, to summarize, uh, popular imagination and much critical reflection frames technology alternatively as a means of salvation and damnation. In this imaginary, robots are a series of racialized narratives and representations that engage concepts of humanness and labor. Human-robot teaming is thus an allegory for race relations in the context of white supremacy and capitalism and rescue robots function as magical Negro tropes. Thus, the lab that we're designing is a fraught space. It's haunted by history, by present contests, by fantasies and nightmares of the future, and by unspoken stories. All robotics labs are haunted in this sense, we're just designing a lab with the ghosts in mind. Thank you.